welcome back to Nala Talk, where we discuss updates in the field of genetics and its implementation in clinical settings. I'm Esther, one of the doctors here at Nala Genetics, and we are joined, of course, by Fadli. Hi, Fad. Hi, Esther. How are you? Good. Very good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And nggak kerasa ya ini udah Desember loh. I know. Yeah. It's very fast. Um, and I guess just continuing our, our conversation from last week, um, you know, with the festivities coming, um, we're going to talk about another important topic, and it's closely uh, related to food, um, and that is gout. Gout itu mungkin Indonesia-nya um, apa, asam urat, ya? Gitu. Jadi, urat, yeah. yeah, asam urat. Jadi, uh, I'm sure everybody has heard about that, gitu, so you know a family member who might be affected by it. But let's just... Um, describe um, again just to refresh our memory uh, about how how does gut gut present gitu the gut usually um, affects the um, the joints in the lower parts uh, of your legs gitu. usually the the big toe at the base of the big toe but it can also affect sort of other joints uh, in the knees and elbows um, and usually um, is very painful I think. Uh, from the reports that I heard or patients that I encountered in hospitals, gitu, biasanya you can't even have like a sheet over the joint, like it's that painful. Um, as with inflammatory um, uh, arthritis, gitu ya, uh, it's uh, quite swollen, red, um, very uh, difficult and painful to move the joint. And um, it is caused by, well, not really caused, but it is closely linked with um, excess uh, uric acid levels. Uh, in the blood, gitu ya. And and how do we get uric acid um, at all, elevated uric acid levels if that's from the pharmacy's point of view? Yeah, so thanks for that, Esther. So so the thing is that uh, uric acid is something that is uh, normally produced as a byproduct uh, in our body when we, uh, what do you call it, uh, digest proteins and other kind of like meats. Uh, uric acid itself is very lowly soluble. So at a lower, low, low concentration, it actually is soluble inside our blood uh, system. But at increasing uh, the concentration, it actually gets precipitated out as crystals. So if you can take a look at it, it looks like like small diamond, uh, conical, uh, double-edged kind of thing. And these kind of crystals can actually lodge in the uh, joints where there's uh, actually a, a sort of some pit or a more uh, constricted <laughs> space, right? When it gets lodged, it, it feels like a need, like like a, a stack of needles that's being pushing through the joints. So that's why it's super painful. And when that happens, the body actually reacts to think that that's actually a foreign object, and then inflammation happens, and even more pain actually happens. That's why this kind of uh, gout flare could be unbearable. And it is really painful for most. Yeah, that's why it's, it's the because it's the precipitation of this uh, monosodium urate that actually is 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 present in the joints. And how does that happen? So two things: when uh, uric acid is usually um, excreted out through our renal system and a little bit from the intestines, and uh, so there can be two causes of over. Uh, uh, concentration of this is it can be either uh, hyper um, hyper production of uric acid where you eat too much of uric acid uh, producing substance or there's a lower uh, rate of uh, excretion or under excretion of the uric acid where maybe the, that you are genetically predisposed or that you have some problem with your kidneys so uh, in terms of like uric acid there are uh, production and excretion there are several risk factors that actually can uh, uh, increase the predisposition to gout. Like if you are a man like me, if you are <laughs> <laughs> if you are uh, overweight as well, like myself as well, and you're not. <laughs> you're not overweight. If you're also um, old, of an older age uh, as well, there's a higher chance because uh, factors like your kidney function could actually fall uh, lower, and when you're uh, higher in, in terms of like weight, your blood pressure could be higher as well because the causing the uh, uh, kidney function not to be uh, optimal, uh, etc. But interestingly, uh, so we we as uh, the, the doctors and the medical professionals try to treat this in two ways. So gout treatment is usually classified into two parts. One is the maintenance part, and second is actually for treatment part when there's a flare. 
maintenance. Maintenance usually you focus on the fact that you want to have the uric acid uh, maintained at the low level where they don't crystallize up. And treatment is when you want to actually treat the pain instead of like uric acid directly. So we want to talk about genetics, Esther. So we're going to be talking about the maintenance part where we use allopurinol, right? Maybe we talk about yeah. a little bit about allopurinol, Esther. What do you think? Yeah, for sure. Just to add on a little bit to what you said. So yes, um, just some interesting, just to, just to share with the audience, just some interesting um, statistics uh, that has to do with gout and sort of uric acid uh, levels is that interestingly, only a minority of, of people with um, hyperuricemia, um, so that is like excess or elevated uh, uric acid levels more than normal, uh, but only 10% of them actually develop gout. But 80 to 90 percent of patients with gout are hyperuricemic, so that's why I think there um, there has been a, a focus in lowering the uric acid therapy because it's closely linked to um, the excess levels of um, uric acid that is found in, in gout patients. Um, and to also add on to your point, you know, some diet um, such as red meat, uh, organ meat such as liver, and then like purine which uh, rich seafood like anchovies, sardines, trap tuna, um, and alcoholic beverages, you know, like as we're um, entering the sort of festive season with the parties and the hampers, uh, even though, you know, with caution because there's PPKM or some restriction in place. Um, so those things can actually increase your uric acid levels. And as you clearly pointed out as well before, um, as you get older um, and with decreasing renal function, um, uh, also, certain medical conditions uh, with that that um, has uh, that have an impact uh, on your uh, comorbidities and your renal function um, can also um, increase the chance of you developing uh, gout. Um, and as well as uh, if you have you know previous uh, uh, surgery to the area or if you have previous like recurrent attacks, um, then that's probably sort of. Um, gives the trajectory that you're more likely to develop that in the future as well. And so, yeah, I'm glad that you bring it uh, home to, to the treatment uh, as well as the genetic uh, implications um, that we can learn today. Um, just to sort of give uh, a brief overview of the acute treatment uh, for the flare-ups, uh, which we usually um, encounter in the hospital setting, um, is usually uh, prednisolone or, or like some sort of corticosteroid would be the first line and um, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, such as colchicine or other anti-inflammatory therapies. Um, but yeah, if you have recurrent attacks or if you have deposition in soft tissue with a, with, uh, as evidenced by TOFI um, uh, or you have uh, crystal deposited elsewhere, like for example, um, in your, as a kidney stone, then uh, it is maybe time to consider uh, urate lowering therapy, such as you mentioned, uh, allopurinol. And so maybe can you explain how allopurinol decreases the level of uric acid? Yeah. So, so it's actually simply uh, allopurinol is something that is classified as a centine oxidase inhibitor, or uh, yeah, centine oxidase inhibitor. So, so this uh, means that it actually uh, inhibits an enzyme called xanthine oxidase. Why do we want to inhibit this enzyme? It's because uric acid is actually produced from a chemical that is called xanthine that is present in our body. And by inhibiting this, uh, this function of, of, uh, of modification, we actually want to lower the level of uric acid inside our body. So basically, allopurinol actually do and attach this to this enzyme. Um, yeah, so that's simply how it works. Mm. And um, of note, uh, with regards to uh, the links to sort of genetic variations, um, can you explain maybe some of the, the genes that are involved uh, that could cause sort of adverse reaction or sort of side effects when starting this allopurinol therapy? Right. So allopurinol, um, interestingly, the, it, it actually causes a higher incidence of Stevens-Johnson syndrome in Asians, uh, and so also some Af African Americans at a lower extent. Uh, this has been found to be due to uh, genetic uh, polymorphism that is HLA-B5801. So the presence of this HLA-B5801 uh, variation inside our body 
which is actually HLA-B is actually a type of the uh, white blood cell uh, receptors. Uh, and with this kind of variation, right, the immune system is actually primed to overreact to the fact that allopurinol is inside our body. So when allopurinol is present, there's a high likelihood that this uh, immune system will react in a way that it can actually attack the cells in our body, or they're called keratinocytes, that is the lining of most of the surface of our body. So when that happens, and when the keratinocytes are attacked, they actually get a detached from the, 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 the base of the body, and it actually can cause something like of a, a person who has gotten a severe burn all over the body. So it's like the skin, the eyes, also the, 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 even the tongue, it looks like it's been detached. So it is a severe and also life-threatening side effect. And in, interestingly, it's also shown that people who have uh, HLA-B5801 uh, variation, there's, uh, especially in Asians, right, there's actually a 7.4% of chance of developing this kind of severe reaction. Mm -hmm. So it is, it is actually quite scary and mm. um, something that to be of note, basically. Yeah, yeah. No, that's uh, quite a, a significant proportion. I mean, you know, it's not as, as high as uh, above 15 or 20 percent, but still like in a big population, like that's yeah. still, yeah, a significant uh, amount um, of, of people. And so um, how do we successfully uh, commence this allopurinol therapy uh, with the intention of, uh, uh, of being a prophylactic, uh, prophylactic treatment yeah, for, for gout. So yeah, so allopurinol is still one of the first line or the mainstay of the treatment of uh, chronic uh, gout. So we don't want to straight away uh, prevent or, or avoid the use of allopurinol for all ages. So what we can do is probably is the fact that we can do a, a test uh, to see the presence of HLA-B5801 variation inside the, the patient before we prescribe. And this has been increasingly more affordable due to the uh, increasing availability of the test. So what I would recommend, right, for patients who are going to be getting like uh, gout treatment to just do a simple test and just check whether they have this kind of um, uh, uh, variation. And especially, it has been uh, mentioned that the test of HLA-B5801 has been cost-effective in a U.S. study uh, for uh, patients who are of Asian as well as uh, African-American descent. Yeah, so why not mm. discuss it? Or even uh, just one step further, uh, as an insurance, maybe we can also try to push for preemptive genotyping where we don't mm. only test for HLA-B, or we can also test for other kind of genes to see if they have any predisposition of adverse drug reaction. And with mm. testing of more than one gene, right, it would be sure to be more cost-effective because you are doing it at one go and just running the sample at one go and just to test all kinds of enzymes that are uh, responsible for drug uh, uh, metabolism. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, hopefully with, um, as you said, you know, increasing availability and awareness, uh, both in sort of the patient population as well as the doctors who prescribe this uh, medications, uh, hopefully we can offer this to patients, especially very relevant for Indonesian and you know, Singaporean uh, cohort, um, even that we have uh, like a, wide, uh, a big population of Asian people. Um, to, to make sure that uh, before they start the therapy, um, the information is already available so we can start it safely. Um, and so just sort of to recap that uh, we acknowledge that, you know, especially with the, the coming season, you know, we want to sort of watch our diet, especially with regards to uh, our intake of red meat, seafood, um, drinks, uh, alcoholic beverages, and sugary drinks, you know, that can increase uh, the levels of your acid. Um, that can sort of further um, exacerbate uh, or contribute to the development of gout, especially with increasing age. And if you have if you have other comorbidities that put you at risk, for example, like high blood pressure, obesity, um, chronic kidney disease, um, uh, and diabetes, you know, um, and 
you, you want to be cautious uh, of these things and have that at the back of your mind. Um, and just in general, I think like if you eat better, um, exercise that would, uh, be, uh, that would impact your health greatly. Um, so you're, um, you don't, uh, develop, um, those nasty diseases, including, uh, one of it being, um, gout. Um, and, uh, we've talked about sort of the, the treatment for acute flare-ups as well as the maintenance therapy. Um, and you further on, um, elaborated about, um, the genetic implications or the genetic factors that can impact, um, starting uh, allopurinol and um, the risk of um, Stephen Johnson or like adverse drug reaction. Do you want to add anything like that? Oh, you've, you've summed it up uh, perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. All good. So I hope you learned something new today um, and um, uh, we hope to see you in the next episode of Nala Talk. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you.